till you are left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on a hill. Well, I'm not alone, but I'm certainly an ensign on a hill. So here's how it starts. I was reading the daily prayer book given to me by a local rabbi. He gave me a, a large format, one made out in my name. And I was reading the introduction to it. I never read it. And I didn't know what he's talking about. So he starts quoting the Kabbalah and says, the Kabbalah says you can only ascend to heaven only through its particular gate by means of its specific nusach. What does that mean? According to the Kabbalah, I read, and I'm no expert on this. I'm not an actress from Hollywood. She's an expert on everything, including diet foods. According to the Kabbalah, there are in fact 12 nusach, one for each tribe of Israel. There were 12 tribes of Israel, that you know, in accordance with the unique and distinct spiritual quality of each. 12 tribes of Israel, each different. Similarly, I read, there are in heaven 12 gates corresponding to the 12 tribes. The prayers of each tribe, they had different tribes, different prayers, teaches the Kabbalah, can ascend to heaven only through its particular gate by means of its specific nusach. Then the, so the Zohar, another mystical text, teaches this. Since the prayers of the members of each tribe can ascend and enter the heavenly gate only through its own nusach, what if one who does not, does not know to which tribe he belongs? How should he pray? How will his prayers ascend to God? According to the Talmudic and Kabbalistic experts, there is a 13th gate, Shar HaKolel, a general all-inclusive gate for all Jews, no matter to which tribe they belong. So you're saying, well, what if I'm not Jewish? That's your problem, not mine. I'm only reading to you from one particular worldview, one world religion. I can't speak for the others. But the mystics in the, monk, in the Jewish people, the, the very religious people, not the type that you want to vomit from, the bagels and lox Jews in Congress, uh, not the Shuma Jew. You want to start naming the ones that turn my stomach? The type that crucified Jesus? I've said it before. I'm not ashamed to say it. I'll say it again. The Sanhedrin voted. The Sanhedrin had a vote. The ruling rabbis, 80 of them. The majority said crucify Jesus, but there was a minority of Jews who said, do not crucify the man, Jesus of Nazareth, because he's innocent. I like to believe I'm part of the group that would have said, do not crucify Jesus, and that the Schumers and the others who turned my stomach and the type that made me leave New York because they were so corrupt and evil, I like to believe they were the type, the crucifiers, who were crucifying America right now, along with their friends, the Goyim. Corresponding 13th gate in heaven, a 13th nusach through which the prayer of any Jew can ascend. So there it is, the 13th gate. Then coincidentally, see, I'm doing it. I didn't want to do it. Here we go. Then coincidentally, I, I'm reading a lot. You know, it's summertime. I like to read in the summer for some reason. Every one of my family's traveling somewhere. <laughs> I don't like to travel. I told them, here's where I travel from here to here. <laughs> you know, it's hard enough to travel from here to here without getting falling into a cavern once in a while. So I'm, I'm, somehow I stumbled on a book, The Thirteenth Gate, Travels Amongst the Lost Tribes of Israel. I said, I got to buy the book. It's an obscure book. Don't look for it. it. Please don't buy the book. And it's about people around the world who have studied and believe that they're part of the, the lost tribes of Israel. So here's a picture of a Japanese calligrapher and art collector who believes he is a member of the lost tribe of Zebulun, the Kiata Synagogue in Japan, for example. What? Right, so there are lost tribes of Israel. And I will tell you something that I think I've hinted at in my past, which I've never really developed, but this is going to have me do it. I found this book shortly after I got that prayer book, and it shows pictures from around the world of Jews that you probably don't even know are Jewish. Did you know about the Falashas? Did you know about them? Did you know how they were saved? Did you know anything about the Israelis who saved them in the 1950s? from slaughter, the black Jews of Ethiopia, the Falashas. You didn't know about them, huh? Occasional cortex didn't teach you that the Jews flew into Africa and rescued them, and they said their prayers had been answered, that after 2,000 years of praying in Africa, these lost Jews, these Falashas, said that one day a bird would come from heaven and come down and lift them and take them 
to the land of Israel? You didn't know that. Jews saved them. Did you know about the Lemba tribe in Johannesburg that they believe they're descended from the lost tribe of Israel? You didn't know that, huh? Guess eh, Joseph Biden didn't teach you any of that. Did you know about um, a Falasha feeding a child in the Um Rakhabit camp? A Falasha woman inside a temple that they built. A Lemba boy. These are all people who believe they're descended from Jews. This may come as a shock to some African Americans listening to the show. that think they don't know anything about this. Maybe they ought to study a little bit more about it. I've studied a lot about it. And now I'll conclude with some other thing, which is this. Here I am born in the Bronx. Actually born in Manhattan, raised in the Bronx and Queens. Now, all the boys of my cast, and we were of, I would say, the lower socioeconomic, not poor, just above, you know, moved out of the Bronx to escape the true poverty, rented an apartment in Queens, blah, blah, blah. But most of the boys I knew became doctors or lawyers or businessmen. None of them, you know, were intellectual in any manner. They were nice boys. They were my friends. I really don't know what drove me. What the hell was I doing in Fiji collecting medicinal plants? What was I doing in the Marquesas, one of the most remote islands? island chains on the planet studying traditional medicine Tonga, Samoa what was I doing why was I driven there and what went on in those nights that I sat in a bure in Fiji, no electricity it was still 1968, no electricity back in the hills and drinking kava kava with the men all night long drinking, drinking kava kava till our skin disappeared and our Faces disappeared in the darkness, and there was no light except maybe reflected moonlight inside the bure. And all that was there were the 12 or 13 or 15 black men and me. And all that was left were eyes. That's all we all saw of each other. So this white guy, all these black guys, and then they would say to each other in Fijian for me to hear, I don't think he's American. I think he's Fijian, don't you? I don't know what it meant, but I will tell you, I found certain things about the Fijian people that had me convinced sometimes that they were one of the lost tribes of Israel, which is why I was obsessed with studying their folkways, most particularly their healing plants. Who knows what drives us in life? Do we really know? Do we really know what motivates us to do the things that we do? Are we that conscious? Can we really understand the depths of our soul, the connections to God, the great power, Hashem, whatever you want to say, Allah, great power, God, whatever. I've told you before, I know many of you don't believe me. I've been with witches in Fiji who could read the future of people. I told you that story before. Maybe you don't believe it, but I saw it with my own eyes. We were going out to the Asawa Islands, and I took a young friend with me. He was, a, he was like an Adonis kind of guy. He was the photographer. He was afraid of nothing. He was just like Billy Budd, afraid of nothing. And um, he was going to be the photographer on the trip. So we took the boat out from Nandi to the Asawa Islands, and something happened. Now... Two days before in Suva, we went to see the card reader that my friend Dominico used to take us to before every expedition. She'd throw the cards and read our future. Look, I'm a rationalist, so it, I don't know what it meant, but I figured I'll, you know, hedge my bet here. This is what they believe in. I'll follow it. So, you know, normally she'd say things are going to go, okay, whatever, you know, just a normal thing. This time she threw the cards out, the Fijian woman, and she didn't want to read what, what she saw. And I had to say, please tell me what you see. And she was very shy. She didn't want to read it. And she said, I, I, I don't want to. So we encouraged her to read it. And she said, Michael, your work is going to go well, what you're here for. But him, and she trailed off. And she stopped. Well, he laughed. You know, we paid no attention to it. Two days later, we get off the ship from Nandi to the Asawas. And... Uh, I said he was a daring young guy and 
he jumps off the boat barefooted and you know walks across the sand we're going through the sand and then in the strand and then into the village but on the sand he says ouch and he stepped on something that was sharp and cut his foot and in a few minutes he couldn't walk and this is a tough strong kid so we had to carry him back to the boat luckily i traveled with a medical kit and had antibiotics i always took various stuff with me and we gave it to him and then he went back we could we had to go back to suva put him in a hospital and he got very sick almost died they saved him and what happened was is that he stepped on a piece of poisonous coral you don't know the tropics are extremely dangerous people don't know anything about the plants the animals nothing so you could step on a piece of poisonous coral and literally cut your foot you know about reef swimming anyone who's lived in the tropics knows if you scratch your foot on a coral reef you can get a very bad infection well he didn't scratch his foot he actually something penetrated the the foot and um he got sepsis almost died but he said he was bitten by a ghost that's how he did it he put it in a poetic term but she saw it. The point of my story is the card reader saw it in advance. How did she see this? And it goes back to what I was saying to you before. Why was I, a kid from Queens, Bronx, Manhattan, why was I not following the paths of my cohorts? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, whatever, businessman. Whatever they were doing, what the hell motivated me to be a dreamer and go collect plants in the Fiji Islands? Why? And sit for those horrible nights. I didn't enjoy it at all. I didn't like it. I just didn't like it. I would much rather have been home. But I had to do it. There was some comp something compelling me. And that wraps up the wrap of the day. And with God's will and your listenership, I shall return God knows when. Only God knows when. Do I know what's coming tomorrow? Do you? Do you know what's coming tomorrow with the ossified leadership in this country? The, the leadership. Who runs the Republican Party? Moonshine Mitch. Who runs the country? Who runs the country? Demented Joe. Who runs Congress? Hidden faces. Lobbyists. Who runs the media? Perverts, demons, and criminals. My friends, we've never been in a place like this before, and I only wish that they, I could imagine that I could open my eyes and see only the good in every person, the positive in every circumstance, and the opportunity in every challenge. But unfortunately, I'm only a man. Thanks for listening to the Savage Rap. Hit the subscribe button, but be sure to go to the podcast about the wolves. You're going to love it. Thanks for listening. I love the YouTube shows.